Hey, Fred, how are you doing? Pretty good, Angel. How are you doing? Stove just died. <laughs> oh, that's fun. We, we've been having ongoing boiler issues for the better part of the year, so I feel your pain. Like you're okay now, or? After many thousands of dollars were doled out, yes. Wow. <laughs> we do have pizza. <laughs> I got a guy coming in right now. He was supposed to come at five. Oh, for your stove. Yeah. So gotcha. he was so he was supposed to come at five PM and he just reached out and said, Hey, I'm in the area. I'm like, oh. Oh, gotcha. Well, that's good, right? In the sense yeah. that you yeah. have a functional so stove earlier. <laughs> you only have me right now, if that's okay. Uh Crystal. sure, sure. Crystal unexpectedly, she's a teacher and she okay. unexpectedly got a COVID uh vaccine Ooh. appointment and okay so this I life life's happening <laughs> yeah exactly so i assume you're a new yorker so you know how precious those are so she's oh, yeah. out the door to go go get stuck that's her yeah. she's, she's an essential worker i am i am expendable so i did not get an appointment. yeah just give me one second okay i'm sorry hey how's it going man well thanks for coming bro i appreciate it my wife's talking my dog's tripping it's going crazy over here man <laughs> come here come here come here <laughs> i'm gonna oh, keep this there. man this, i'm gonna i'm gonna keep all this craziness in the uh that's right it's real life it's cinema podcast Maritime. yeah that's right this is like reality podcasting the city of new york Boricua from the bronx <laughs> my name is fred van lenti uh i am a writer primarily of comic books uh i worked for a long time for marvel comics where i wrote amazing spider-man and marvel zombies and Iron Man Legacy and uh, Wolverine First Class and many, many other titles. Uh, I'm also known for doing nonfiction comics, um, such as Action Presidents, which is our middle grade book I do with Brian Dunleavy, which is in stores now. Uh, we also did the comic book History of Comics and spinning out of that uh, with my wife, the playwright Crystal Skillman, who is, you know, who has her COVID appointment today. <laughs> so that's why I'm flying solo. Uh, uh, we co-wrote a play called King Kirby about the life of the great comic book artist, Jack Kirby, co-creator of the Marvel Universe. And uh, it has been turned into an excellent podcast drama that is streaming right now on the Broadway Podcast Network uh, and on iTunes and Audible and Spotify and Google Podcasts and wherever you get your podcast. I actually listened to it last night on Spotify and it was very cool. I enjoyed awesome. it. It actually gave me some ideas of things that I could potentially do. Oh, is that right? Is, well, oh, you from know- From a podcasting standpoint or from yes, being sir. a comic artist in the depression? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, just just in terms of expression, the way you guys did it, yes. it, it was, you know, like, like um, different characters talking and the storytelling, you know, I'd always been trying to figure out ways of expressing myself and listening to that last night. I, I kind of was inspired by that. So there's another uh, added bonus effect of, uh, <laughs> That's awesome. know, of, of, of the, you know, the, the play. So this was originally a play right. and now you're in putting it. Uh, and it's been done in Calgary and Seattle and DC and San Francisco and a bunch of other places. Uh, but this actually is the, what happened was, is we funded the first play. The play was put on at something called the Comic Book Theater Festival. And we uh, crowdfunded the money to put on the production through Kickstarter. And one of the things we offered our Kickstarter backers was an audio recording of the show. Now, due to various uh, union regulations, and I'm very pro-union, so we were cool with this. Uh, you're not really allowed to film a play and then you know present it to an audience without paying the actors x amount of money that quite frankly we couldn't uh <laughs> afford so uh instead what we offered the kickstarter backers was an audio recording which we actually did uh we recorded the show in midtown comics downtown which is midtown comics location on fulton street by the south street seaport and so we actually recorded it in a comic book store, which sort of as a sort of an extra sort of excitement. And that was in 2014 when the show was first staged. And there's been a bunch of production since then, but we've all been stuck inside because of COVID. And, um, you know, there's been such an, an insurgence and in interest in podcasts. Um, uh, what was cool was that someone approached us and said, hey, have you thought about adapting this as a podcast drama? 
and I grew up, I think I'm a bit older than you. And I, I grew up listening to like my, my dad had like recordings of like, had like records, like actual records of like the sh old shadow radio plays. Like I actually, I was enough of a huge nerd that I loved radio drama and, and all that stuff from the thirties and forties and fifties. And so uh, I was like, that's awesome. But you know, what's funny is that we realized that we had, that we actually had this recording. We had the original cast doing the show. So this is a troop of actors that had already done the show a dozen times, right? Or more doing the play, just reading it essentially. And so we took that and then we approached Bobby Cronin, who's this extremely talented composer that Crystal's done a bunch of musicals with like Marion Max uh, and a bunch of others. And he very graciously agreed to recut the show, the audio into what you heard, right? Into episodes and actually added music. He wrote all that music you heard is original to our show. And so it just gives so much richness and so much excitement to a story that frankly, not too many people know about and more should. Yeah, I, I had, I, I kind of feel like I might've heard the name, but I don't know that I did, you know? Sure. And actually you guys said that in the email, the most famous comic creator you never heard of. I, I was gonna listen to everything and I saw it, you guys are gonna trickle them down um, yeah, over time. Yeah, we should talk about that if it's not a spoiler or not. But I, I suppose people know, right, at this point. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, people will know. <laughs> it's not like, you know, this is going to be something new revealed. So he, just so that I can understand, this cat created or co-created these characters that, like, the ones we're seeing. Because I'm, I'll, you know, full disclosure, I'm fairly new to comics. I always preferred books. Sure. You know, um. And I always try to get my hand on comic books, so to speak, novels of the stories. Okay. You know, sure. um, like the I, prose novel adaptations and stuff. Correct. Like correct. I, I always sure. preferred that. Okay. And only recently, and by recently, I mean like ever since like, like uh, the whole Avengers things came out, right? Since that stuff came out, I said, I want to know these stories more. And I've always wanted to. And I kind of said, well, I have no choice. If I really want to know the real story, I'm going to have to read a comic, right? And I always, I just found it very hard to read. So I went and got myself an iPad, got myself a comic book reader. And well, I also tried with my physical comics um, and I just gave it a chance because I always found it distracting, but I just okay. gave it a chance and then I really got into it. Oh, that's so now, great. I mean, comics are a kind of visual literacy, right? You know, I mean, I, I remember I'd been reading them since I was four and, it, but it's, it's like, it's like learning the alphabet, right? You've got to learn a whole new way of kind of storytelling, you know, like the most common thing, I don't know if this was part of your challenge, but one thing I get, cause I, I teach a lot and I sort of go around the world and talk to people. I do get people who are like, do I look at the pictures first or do I read the balloons first or is it change and so on and so forth and I, I well, it was it was the sequence of the balloons I found confusing which one am I supposed to read you know right. um what's happening I just want to consume the story I never right. cared for the pictures you know sure and 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 even now I'm able to read it but I find that I don't focus so much on the pictures right which which I guess is it's kind of a disservice to the artwork of it and I've been trying to trying to get understand it more it just it's, it's it's different for me like i i'd, I'd always just want to see the letters and get the story you know um right. but i yeah yeah but i enjoy them and that's part of the, the challenge for somebody like jack kirby right who was an artist now you know kirby uh was was legendary for his output he could draw nine pages a day which you know these days uh, you're lucky if you get an artist who can do a page a day or a page oh. for a few days um and uh and, but he, his legacy, his, his, um, his claim to fame sort of got overwhelmed by the guy who was known as his writer, who's Stan Lee, right? Who's the, this was, was the oh. head of Marvel and is the avuncular kind of guy with the mustache and the glasses you see in cameos. In oh, so, so Stan, years ago. Stan was more just writing and. Right. Well, it, even, but you see, there's a lot of evidence that he wasn't even doing that. He was directing, he was the boss, right? And he's saying, okay, like, for example, let's say, you know, because Kirby was the first artist on the Avengers, for example. And Lee worked, because they had about a dozen different titles, and Lee, quote, unquote, wrote all of them. And he would do something called the Marvel Method, which is he'd basically call up the cartoonist and say, okay, in this issue, just for example, let's have the Avengers fight, I don't know, Dr. Doom, right? 
Uh, Kirby also co-created slash created Dr. Doom. And Kirby would have to sit there and just draw a story. There was no script, right? There was no like written um, instruction. It was all these phone calls or these personal meetings. Like, he, like Kirby lived in Long Island, right? And he would take the train in to Manhattan and meet with Lee and they'd talk it over face to face. But then Kirby would go off and in a few weeks, draw 20 pages of the Avengers fighting uh, Dr. Doom. And he would write little notes in the, in the margins of the boards about what the character should say. Then he'd bring the artwork, drop it off in Manhattan to the, to the offices and Lee would put in the words. Uh, as far as I know, he dictated them to sec secretary or he dictated them directly to the, to the letterer. Uh, there again, there was not a lot of actual like writing, like whether it's typing or longhand or anything like that. But one thing Lee did that was very effective, and I think did go a long way to making Marvel comics as successful as they were, was he would talk to you like a narrator in the captions and in the letter columns and in, in his um, editorials they would have in all the comics. And so the one thing leading uh, the through line between all the comics, right, was this guy, Stan Lee. In fact, even after Stan Lee stopped writing or working for the company directly, there was a period when I was a kid in the 70s and 80s that every Marvel comic said Stan Lee presents, you know, Amazing Spider-Man or Stan Lee presents, you know, G.I. Joe, a real American hero, which was crazy because Stan Lee had nothing to do with the creation of G.I. Joe. That was Hasbro, you know, uh, as Stan Lee presents Star Wars, you know what I mean? Like, just Stan Lee did <laughs> Star Wars, but Marvel published this, the, the, Stan, the Star Wars comics and they wanted to, you know, Marvel wanted to have that through line. And so when, of course, the movies started coming out, the um, uh, the filmmakers would have Stan Lee, you know, Al, people don't know, Alfred Hitchcock was the director who first started this. Like Alfred Hitchcock would appear in all the movies that at least started very early on to appear in all the movies that he directed. And so that became a thing that became part of the marketing, right? Of of the Alfred Hitchcock movies is where does Alfred Hitchcock show up to the point where we actually had a TV show called Alfred Hitchcock Presents. But anyway. Great show, by the way. And so Stan Lee uh, became sort of the Alfred Hitchcock of the Marvel movies and that he started to show up and had in people, that was one of the things people right, were showing up at the theater to sort of wait for is how, how and when and what context is Stan Lee going to show up. Um, sadly, uh, you know, that extra level of movie fame meant that Stan Lee kind of ended up uh, getting, he really got played by a series of kind of cheap hustlers and grifters toward the end of his life. And so the end of Stanley's life is not, not really a great story, but ironically, this happened after he sort of overwhelmed Jack Kirby and some of the other creators, most famously Steve Ditko, who's the guy who co-created Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. Um, and to the point where I think if you ask the average person who created the Marvel Universe, a lot of them would go, what? <laughs> Most people go, huh? What do you mean? Uh, but I think those people would give you an answer would say Stan Lee because he he's sort of the uh, the face of the franchise, right? Just sort of like how Walt Disney, by appearing in the Disneyland TV show and, and, and his public appearances sort of got fixated with a bunch of movies that to be honest with you, he didn't really have a whole lot to do with. Um, Stan Lee was sort of the mascot of, of Marvel. Okay. I apologize for that. Completely, uh, <laughs> totally not expected. Um, but I no think we got a stove. I think we have a functional stove. We'll know. If, if you don't see this episode up and you see some story on the news about a queen's apartment, uh, <laughs> you know. Both in flames. Yeah. Then you know, you know, Hope you not. see a Stanley throughput. And as he recorded the podcast, the stove exploded. <laughs> Angel went home to his home planet. <laughs> how did you get interested in this in this um, artist? Like, how did it come about that? Because it sounds from what you're telling me that uh, it's almost like he got shafted. Yeah. Right? Uh, you know? Oh, well, that's um, exciting. I mean through the next four episodes of the King Kirby podcast, you will learn all about it. <laughs> so uh, cool, cool. fear not, it is coming your way <laughs> quite quickly. Uh, and in a very dramatic and exciting and entertaining fashion, I might add. Um, uh, yeah, so what happened, so I grew up in the seventies, uh, which was right when Jack, which was in the aftermath of Jack Kirby leaving Marvel Comics. And so what Marvel did was they put out a bunch of books 
by Stan Lee. It's at by Stan Lee on the cover called with titles like Origins of Marvel Comics, Son of Origin, all that stuff, where basically Mar- Stan Lee gives his side of the story of the creating of Marvel Comics. And while nothing in there is necessarily lies that I'm aware of, it does leave out a bunch of stuff, namely what I was referring to earlier, which is that, I mean, part of the problem is that when you're eight, right, and somebody tells you something, you believe it, right? And that's when mm-hmm. I was reading these books, you know? Then when I got older, when I got into writing myself, and for that matter, when I became a professional comic book writer, I realized, wait, what I get paid to do is not what Stanley got paid to do. I work. <laughs> he <laughs> tells somebody, you do this, and that's it. And then he pick, but he picks up the check for writing. I also used to work in the United Nations Pension Fund, and that's called in in the pension world double dipping, right? Where you're getting a pension, but you're also have a salary from some other job you're doing that's not related. Where you, when you're supposed to be retired, right? Mm. Uh, so Stanley was essentially double dipping, um, but he was this very avuncular character. He was very good. He had a very good ear for a specific kind of dialogue and kind of self-deprecating humor. Um, the superheroes all had layers to them. They were all sort of tortured, right? Spider-Man is the most famous example of that, of a superhero who's got, as they said in the 60s, super problems, right? You know, Batman is a rich guy who has models dripping off his arm. Spider-Man can barely afford his rent and is constantly hustling to afford to buy his girlfriend dinner, you know? Um, and, and, And while Stan did not, I'm not saying Stan didn't, contribute anything to the comics he was sort of like um i mean what's a good example he's almost like the factory owner that takes full credit for all the work that the other people are doing and also when you know it's a little bit different when the factory is comprised of like two people right stanley created all these great comics quote unquote from this period between in the 60s right when Jack Kirby was working for him, when Steve Ditko was working for him, but then when Jack Kirby quit in 1969, suddenly Stanley's creative output essentially ends, right? Well, Kirby went on to create all these great characters, like for example, the Zack Snyder Justice League cut drop, the trailer dropped over the weekend. That we're yes, recording, right? yes, I did see that, yeah. The big characters featured that were Dark Side, create, totally created by Jack Kirby, you know, oh. after he left Marvel, after he was working with Stan Lee. Uh, Steppenwolf, the main, the villain in Justice League, also created by Jack Kirby after he left Marvel and after he left Stan Lee. You know, the next big Marvel movie is going to be The Eternals, also 100% created by Jack Kirby, wrote, wrote and drew after he, he left DC and came back to Marvel, while Stan Lee's creative output pretty much begins and ends with Stripperella, a one-season Pamela Anderson cartoon, you know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but you know, he, in the 80s, when they made cartoons out of the Marvel comics, uh, Stanley was the narrator, and this sort of became a trend where Stan was essentially, the unkind way to put it would be Stanley is the Ronald McDonald of, you know, Marvel <laughs> comics, right? He's the face, he's the mascot, he's the Chuck E. Cheese. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, famously, uh, Marvel, you know, he didn't really have any ownership of the characters, so... Uh, he got a million. He, he had a contract with Marvel at the end of the year that supposedly paid him a million dollars every year, basically just to be a brand ambassador. And he had a wife, and I'm not telling any stories of the school, but he had, he, had, he had a family that spent all his money essentially. And the the, the money mm-hmm. that his family didn't spend, he had a bunch of grifters and con artists kind of surround him, and they took that. And so it's a really really a very sad story. But Jack Kirby uh, didn't get a dime until actually, uh, and the heir sued Disney. And in fact, the year King Kirby, our play was first put on is the year that Disney settled with the Kirby heirs. The Supreme Court actually was going to hear the case. And now uh-huh. you see Jack Kirby's name in the credits for the Avengers movies. And a lot of but this was Kirby after Kirby. he was gone. <laughs> yeah, Kirby died in 1993, I believe. I mean, like, so while he was alive, he wasn't property credited for his stuff. And he didn't get a dime. Jesus Christ. Man. Except for the page rate, you know, when he literally just turned in the art. Stan Lee at least got a million dollars a year. Now, I will point out that Stan Lee got ripped off too. Like that million dollars a year, if he was in fact the co-creator, is nowhere near the amount of money he should be getting. But at least he got a million dollars a year. But then his his family owned the company. Like there was a lot going on there. So uh, yeah, so so they got shafted. So Kirby got shafted. Steve Ditko, who created Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, got shafted. Uh, Is he also, he also passed? 
Oh, we're still oh, yeah. around. For, yeah, all these folks died very recently. Steve Ditko died last year. Stanley oh, wow. died a few years ago. Is it kind of like, like when you work for a company, what you create is actually theirs? Is that the scenario that happened here? Yeah, legally that's called work for hire. Right, right. But the work for hire laws, don't forget the, the work for hire laws that you and I under, operate under today did not get passed until 1976. And all the major creations of the Marvel Universe, and for that matter, the DC Universe that Kirby was also involved in, that all happened prior to 76. So even if it was by our current standards work for hire, those standards didn't exist legally prior to 1976. And this is why Disney was so was freaking out, obviously, about the Supreme Court hearing Kirby's case. Because if the Supreme Court ruled that either A, you had to pay all these people who created stuff for you prior to 1976, or B, worse, that some of the stuff would be, you know, public domain, bye-bye mm. Mickey Mouse, Goofy, Donald uh, Duck, the whole wow. gang, right? So they would have completely screwed themselves. So Disney opened up the vault mm. and paid the Kirby heirs what Kirby should have gotten, one hopes, while he was alive. Wow. We have any idea what the family gotten that type of settlement or is it undisclosed like, it's uh it's not disclosure agreements yeah so right right you know, we have no legal wow. recourse to find out but it, it is reportedly substantial well good i mean damn that, yeah. that 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 sucks i mean you know that he wasn't around but at least his uh you know <laughs> his his children his and grandchildren grandkids, yeah. family at least somebody will will benefit yeah exactly and, isn't it crazy how how these companies they're you know you know they're dirty the way they do things and it's bizarre man and i mean that whole thing like like my son was telling me about um because he's he he got into it a little bit before me um and he sent me oh they can't use this character because they don't own this character they sold this character sure and i'm just like what the hell Most man it's consolidated guess. now though since disney bought fox because fox they had sold off, Marvel had sold off the rights to um, X-Men and Fantastic Four to Fox, right? 20th Century Fox. And then Sony still has technically the Spider-Man uh, license. Right. That's what the whole beef was with, with um, Spider-Man being in the, the MCU and everything that they were talking right. about. And Yeah, the whole you know. army of lawyers had to sit down and, and hash that stuff out like it was a Middle East peace agreement. <laughs> and for those of you who are watching... Uh, WandaVision, they've brought that whole conflict into the actual MCU in the sense that Quicksilver, Quicksilver's rights for whatever reason, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are technically X-Men villains. That's how they started out existence, co-created once again by Jack Kirby. However, uh, Wanda became much more, became almost exclusively associated with the Avengers, mm. while Quicksilver kind of split his time between Avengers and X-Men. So, bizarrely fox had the rights to do quicksilver but then so did marvel and they sort of had a non um you know hostility agreement to to, yeah, to not, not non-compete <laughs> yeah, not, well or or you could compete right so you had a quicksilver in age of ultron which is a marvel movie that got killed yeah. off in that movie right but then there was another quicksilver who appeared in days of future past and evan peters who is alive and he is the version that shows up in WandaVision. Because Which now, is very weird. I, I thought that, right. what the hell? I, I haven't seen the, the last episode, but right. I saw the one prior where he shows up in the end and he says, who's this? I forget what the word, meet something. He said something about, about uh, Vision, but I was like, why'd they bring this guy? You know, like, I don't understand. Like, it's all very confusing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, like, it is. Like, you, you need sort of a, well, they want you to watch other movies, right? They want you to get your money's worth out of your Disney Plus account and rewatch all that stuff. Although I'm not sure the X-Men movies are actually on Disney Plus yet, but anyway. Uh, yeah, so it's weird. <laughs> um, Fantastic Four is now back with Marvel, um, Punisher, a bunch of all those other characters that sort of have their rights. The Hulk is, a, weirdly, the Hulk is a weird case. The Hulk is, his solo movies are technically owned by Universal, his rights. So that's why there's only been one that there's only been that um, I think they have to pay Universal to do a Hulk solo movie, which is why well, they only did the one only did the one with um, I'm blanking on the guy's name. Ed I, Norton. Uh, right, uh, right. Norton. Uh, but yet Hulk can appear in all of these. I worked for the Marvel video games for for a long time. And so like there are all these arcane legal things like like the Submariners 
Namor's rights are completely screwed up. Like that also has to do with Universal and we couldn't have put Submariner in a video game, but he could be in a floor wax or he could appear in a breakfast cereal, but not on in Play-Doh or Weedo. It's all these arcane licensing agreements. Wow. You know what I mean? It's, it, it just will b- melt your brain. Wow. This stuff is bizarre. And all this sort of comes from the fact, as you were, you mentioned earlier, that these corporations don't play well together. <laughs> and they certainly don't play well with actual individual humans who aren't rich enough to have an army of lawyers protect their interests, which people like Jack Kirby absolutely have. And that's really the whole subject of our podcast. Right, right. Now, you say you, you do comics as well. Do you, do you then take steps? Um, are you create? Are you... Are you creating new characters and stuff or, you know, like 20 years from now, we'll see, you know, your characters and uh, some big movie scene. And are you protected? Like, what do you do? How do you handle that? If you've seen Age of Ultron, you've already seen a character I co-created. Her name was Helen Cho, and she's a major character in that film. And Marvel did compensate me for that. Part of the whole scandal, I mean, I did not, you know make that much money off of it but i made some money you know i made more money off of that than kirby ever got wow you know for his uh, entire thing that's every literally almost everyone else who appears in the avengers (laughs) except for ultron himself and helen joe i think actually every single other character in there was more or less created by jack kirby yeah pretty much black widow is more of a gray area but anyway uh uh, yeah, and, and you'll be seeing more of my characters when, when they do the MODOK show on Hulu later this year. So uh, there is, there's been reform. There's been some reform in the comic book industry since the controversy of Jack Kirby trying to get his rights back, uh, uh-huh. which dated really back to the late 70s and the 80s, really since this 1976 law was passed. Um, uh-huh. But, you know, it's still not great. You know, the as with most things in capitalism, the bankers are making more money than anyone else. <laughs> you know, just the system that's been set up, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, and and then you also have a situation which, as someone who has successfully sued someone, non, non-comics non related, uh, oh. you know, it, it, unless you can bilk somebody for a fair amount of money, that's the only way people who aren't rich can afford representation in court. Because unless the law firm, there's no reason for a law firm to take your case if you're not paying them hundreds of dollars an hour if they don't accept some fairly substantial like six-figure payday at mm. the end you know so it 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 hurts everybody but it makes just enough people rich that there's not a big clamor to change it because i'm i'm a working creative person i i have a lot a lot of interest in both sort of the history of um making art and making entertainment and I think a lot of people have this idea that just faceless, you know, that, 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 that our pop culture kind of comes from like a factory or something, right? It just kind of gets spat out. It's not like mm-hmm. you go to a museum and look at a painting, and go, oh, you know, Rembrandt. It's a Rembrandt, so, right. Exactly. <laughs> but that we're supposed to like herald and, and hold up this, uh, the, this, this fine art, right? While entertainment is kind of this low junk. You, 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 you guys did it. express that in the beginning of it. That was very right. prominent. That's right. Yeah, beginning. that's true. Yeah. In yeah, the that's very true. beginning of it, it was, uh, you know, oh, this isn't really art, but, you know, that's here right. it is in the bidding, you know, like it was being kind of snubbed. That's right. Know. Yeah, that, that dialogue, well, that scene is set during an actual auction at Sotheby's that happened in the 90s, right after Kirby died. Oh, so that person really said that? No, I, I, I inartfully phrased that. No, that's a fictional character, but the actual auction is real. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you had actual audio. There is, a, of a, there is a, later on, you'll hear a lot of actual dialogue from actual people, but that's not one of them. It was definitely entertaining, and and um, I'm excited to you know to to see where it goes. Um, awesome. You know, but I I did gather that uh, you know, um, I mean, not from what I heard at the moment, but from my reading and stuff, that uh, you know, my man got shafted, which you know, that kind of blows, but. That is I mean, uh, that is it, an accurate way to put it. Well, I mean, it, it's happened historically to so many artists, music-wise, yeah. right? I mean, even as recent as like like look at Mike Tyson, how he sure. he was um kind of, uh, and I'm sure it still happens even now. Well, I mean, um, Brit- Britney Spears, it took her this long to be freed of her father, you know, and and all the control that he had over her life and her 
her royalties and everything else you know so it's 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 constant you know it's it's that you have creative people have certain talents mm -hmm. that are then exploited by people whose talents are in exploitation right you know I mean? like that's kind of unfortunately what it comes down to is it's very rare you very rarely have someone like you know someone like kanye west or dr dre or somebody who has though that's that simultaneous ability to be both dominant on the business side and dominant on the creative side you know right you know i have a song that was put in a film in india okay and it 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 what was it i was featured in a song right they didn't give me a penny right now i'm, I'm thinking based on the 50 million views that that video has and the success of that film that I should be recognized. <laughs> class action suit time. You too can get a hundred rupees. Yeah. You know, I, I had like uh, one, maybe like six or seven lines in the beginning of the song. And, and, and in the middle of the song, I think I had another six or seven lines, you know, but I didn't get it. Were you playing an instrument or? No, it was verbal. Um, like, like uh, it's a Hindi song on the soundtrack, and I just did a couple of like rap lines. Oh, cool! You know, and they kept them in there, but you know, um, I, they did credit me in the album. Like, you see my name featuring a Rod or whatever. Right. Um, but you know, like I don't get any royalties for that, and I always wondered if if that was something that I should be entitled to or whatever. But I just never, you know, never, right. never really acted on it, but. Well, I mean, unfortunately, yeah. the bottom line, and again, this is also sort of part of the Kirby story, is that is that a lot of times contracts are worth only the amount of money you invest in enforcing them. You know, particularly if you're dealing with people who do not have your best interests at heart, or for that matter, a lot of times it's just indifference. You know, they think you're too too minuscule to bother with, unfortunately. And I I get that too. You know, in various dealings in my life, and you you know, like anything else in life, you got to pick your battles. Yeah. Well, I don't think I can be a, a you know, a Hindi movie studio. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I could be Bollywood, you know. Um, so, you know, I kind of just whatever, you know. I just I put it on my blog, <laughs> featured right. featured in this massive movie song, but it is a movie. It's in a movie, and uh, you know, the soundtrack and stuff. But right, I don't know. I just never, you know. My friends were like, "Well, did you get paid for it?" I was like, "No." He's like, what, are you crazy? It's royalties, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, I don't know nothing about that, you know? Like, right. It's, you know? A, it's a frequent story. Yeah, such is life, right? Is there, um, you know, anything you want to share before we close for the for the audience or anything else yeah. that you want to throw out there? Just search King Kirby in iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. cetera. Um, if you're interested in more of my work, uh, you can check me out on Twitter at Fred Van Lenty. I'm also on Facebook at Fred Van Lenty and fredvanlenty.com. Soon awesome. I'll be starting a newsletter so people can sign up and, and be notified whenever I got new stuff dropping, which is frequently. Yeah, very cool. I'm, I'm definitely going to check all that out. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the podcast. You know, apologies for the the dog running around and screaming and <laughs> the, the explosions in the background. <laughs> all good. Awesome. Cool. cool. Thanks. Andy. Right. Yeah. Thank you, man. I appreciate you taking the time. Enjoy. Peace. You are listening to the NYC talking podcast, www.nyctalking.com. Please like NYC talking on Facebook. Please follow angel R talk on Twitter and Instagram. We are NYC talking the realest lifestyle blog ever. Thanks for listening.